uh, thank God for repeatedly teaching us that the Son of Man is coming on the clouds with the power and great glory. He is coming as King to establish His kingdom on earth, which is related to the eternal kingdom of God. Jesus appears to each of us to be ready for His powerful and glorious appearing and His righteous and majestic kingdom. Lord, help us to be ready. With the vision and hope, with the such hope and vision, the gospel, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of the kingdom, must first be preached to all nations. Each of us may have a such direction. Today we are going to study Luke's version of Jesus' eschatological teaching that leads to his second coming. May God fill us with his hope, the hope of the hope and glory of his coming again. That's why we started repeatedly this third time about Jesus coming again. Luke starts this passage with the words, some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. As you studied, this is Herod's temple, one of the wonders in the ancient world. Some writers say, some writers say it is the greatest building of that time, most impressive. By all accounts, it's the most beautiful building in the world at that time. They say that Herod actually trained priests to become masons, carpenters, craftsmen, so that they would actually lead the work as those who understood holy things. Every stone in the place was made of ma, meza, white, brilliant stone available in Israel. That finally it can be cut and polished. That it, look, it looks like a marble. They flattened the old Jerubbabel temple to the ground and laid the massive new stone from your massive foundation stones that are still there, visible today. The place was large enough to hold hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. And the temple was, of course, contained holy, the holy place and holy of holies. The was surrounded by gate, walls and gates, filled with colonnades and porticos. There were at least 32 caves, pits and cisterns for water storage. All was going to come down. Jesus said, as for what you see here, not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. You know, this is the fourth time Jesus predicted destruction of the temple. Six months ago, yeah, six months before, Jesus lamented over Jerusalem and said, Look, your house is left to you desolate. 
between Luke chapter 13. And then the day before, that's Tuesday, before cleansing the temple, Jesus talked about armies, make armies be an embankment against Jerusalem, and said, they will leave not one stone on another. And in Matthew, on Wednesday, after, before, after giving important teachings, he poured out seven words on religious leaders and lamented over Jerusalem and said, Look, your house is left to you desolate. So now, after he left the temple, sitting on the Mount of Olives, one more time he gave this prediction. Now one stone you left on another, everyone will be thrown down. And some of the disciples were fascinated by the temple. Four times. <coughs> then on August 29th, AD 70, Titus Baspian came in after a long siege and began burning the colonies that surrounded out of court. Yeah. According to historians, one soldier, on his own, against the wishes of Titus, took a torch and threw it in the holy place. The people there tried to put it out, but they couldn't. Down came the holy place and holy of holies. Whole thing was torched. Around 6,000 people, they're trying to find a refuge in the temple, but they were consumed in the fire to death. More than tens of thousands of people were massacred by Romans. The priests, they tried in a feeble way to defend the, their temple. They got up on a parapet, the highest parapet, where there were spikes driven up to keep the birds from perching. Perching. Keep the birds keep perching. And they pulled the spikes out and threw them on the, at the Romans. But it was a useless effort in stopping temple destruction. Exactly, the prophet of Jesus was fulfilled. So mind of disciples, the temple destruction as God's punishment is it indicate that indicates the temple restoration going to happen. That means the kingdom messianic kingdom is very near. So they expect it all in one arrival of the Messiah. So they ask them, when will these things happen? Like the sign that they are about to take place. Mm. Again, the disciples' question was not just about the time and sign about concerning the destruction of the temple, but time and sign about the end of the age. So Jesus gives the longest answer to any answer then, any answer given to mm? The questions, longest answer. So it covers the whole future history, giving an amazing, revelatory, apocalyptic prophecy, pointing to his second coming, which is really astounding, rapturous, and glorious. He replied, Watch out then, you're not deceived. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, I am he, and the time is near. As it also starts in Matthew and Mark, the first thing Jesus mentioned is a deception. We can say that human history is the history of deception since man's fall. But through the coming of Jesus, the truth of light began to shine, 
As John wrote in 1 John, darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. However, as Jesus predicted, the darkness and light, the falsehood and truth, both continue, have continued in his story. It will be so at the end of the age. And this battle between the two will be more and more intense. In light of Jesus' prediction, we can think of how deception has worked in the realm of Christianity. At the end of the 4th century, Gnostics, Gnosticism, Gnostics arose. They think that only elite, some elite can get the knowledge that leads to salvation, and spirit is good, body is evil, so whatever you do with your body, it will be fine. Apostle John furiously fought. He was the one who used the word Antichrist, Antichrist, surely derived from the book of Daniel. Also, Paul, think about Paul. At the farewell speech with the elders in Ephesus, he said, those who distort the truth will arise among you, your members. Now, Pastor Peter, he severely condemned first teachers in Second Peter. And in Catholicism, there is worship of Mary, and Apostle, the Pope's authority is above the authority of scriptures. And Islam has been a Satan counterfeit of Christianity as you thought of last time. And so there are new age movement in our time. So huge deception has been going on throughout history. Huge deception. You can see this. And in our time, so see, it seems that false Christianity, including prosperity gospel, seems to be stronger than true Christianity. So, and then also in our time, with the develop development of technology, deception seems to be more and more powerful. The whole world seems to be going astray. As John said, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The whole world seems to be going astray, under control of the evil one. Yes, the world is deceptive. So as you studied, our hearts are deceitful. So they are working together so badly. And when people refuse to love the truth, God sends the power of delusion that they believe the lie. But Jesus clearly said, do not follow them. Human mind is not reliable at all. Rather, human mind is deceptive. So Paul said in Romans chapter 8, the mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Jesus said, The Spirit gives life. Flesh counts for nothing. The words I will speak unto you are Spirit and their life. It's really cherish and hold the truth of God's word. Not staying on the gray ground. Really cherish and hold the truth of God. So we may not be drifted away by the worldwide deception coming more and more terribly. Yes. No one, you're not deceived. Do not follow them. Amen. Remember, three times we studied this. You are not deceived. Do not follow them. Watch out. That's what Jesus mentioned first. The one word of God, holding one word of God, absolutely, that's win over deception, one word of life. Okay? And then Jesus said about wars and revolutions. Yes. Kingdom against kingdom, with great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences. Look, as a doctor, he could not miss this. What Jesus said, 
pestilences, understandable. Such as COVID-19, yes, there will be pestilences, more and more. Few free events and great signs, we think later. And then he talks about persecution. Yes. It will be brought before kings and governors. And all of count of my name. But this result in you being witnesses to them. Do not worry about what to speak. He will give words and wisdom. Then none of your adversaries will resist or contradict. Yes, some will be martyred. But he promised that the hell you had will perish. Wow, what a promise. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after they can do no more. But I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after killing the body has power to throw you into hell. Fear him. And then he says, The very hairs of your head are all lumbered. Do not be afraid. Fearing God and believing in God's protection, that God, that's one set of faith. Hmm. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Daniela, did you lose your hair this morning? The cow lose my hair. And you take a shower. Several hairs are gone, right? Yeah. Jesus counted them. <laughs> what a protection. Not be afraid. Okay, and then now let's read verse 20 together. Uh, please. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. In that gospel, when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that caused desolation, spoken of through Daniel, let the reader understand. Similar thing is written in Mark's gospel. This seems to be different, or it's written in Luke's gospel or what's written in Matthew and Mark, but basically the same when you refer to Daniel. The abomination that caused desolation refers first to Antiochus Epiphanes. With his army force, he came to the temple and desecrated temple fortress, abolishing daily sacrifice. He set up in the holy place, in the old, very altar, what? Statue of a Greek god, Jews. That's abomination that caused desolation. And Daniel talked about final Antichrist. He only honors the God of fortress, military power, and destroy mighty fortresses. Mm. And he will pitch his tent, royal tent, in the city, Jerusalem, to go Zion. Yes, throughout history, armies surrounded Jerusalem, as you thought of. 870 Roman army and 1095 first of crusades and around 1500 Suleiman the magnificent the great Ottoman Turkish Sultan surrounded it happened throughout history but this is final one strongest army led by the Antichrist that his desolation is near the signal is great tribulation Great distress, great dis tri tri tribulation. Same thing, it's by army power. It happens. Then Jesus said, Let those who are in Judea flee to mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. Jesus could give this realistic advice because he could see them as if they are on the palms of his hand. Hmm? And he says, this is the time of punishment in all that has been written in the scriptures. Time of punishment. In other translations, time of vengeance. We know that God is the God of vengeance, as well as, as God of salvation. Written many parts in Isaiah, and He's the God of vengeance. As for Israelites, God poured out His love upon them, His chosen people. When they went astray, even through adversities and invasion of other countries, finally he kept his promise and sent his son Jesus as the Messiah. But they rejected him and crucified him on the cross. 
when they reject him continually, what happens? God shows vengeance. It says, there will be a great distress in the land, great tribulation in the land. Realize against these people, against these people, his chosen people, more particularly, a million people, written his wrath in Daniel also. Time of wrath, time of punishment, same thing. What he does, he'll get all the nations around Jerusalem. Then the city is tortured, the city. Captured city and the house are ransacked. And half, those, half of the city will be going to exile. The half will be not be taken from the city and the Lord himself will fight against those nations. So two thoughts will be killed, one thought will be saved. Yes, written also Zechariah. So God has whole plan for the salvation work. He's the sovereign. Again, he's the God of Salvation also is God of vengeance, judgment. Knowing this, we may bear God's grace, He will serve His purpose upon us. After this, Jesus says, there are signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, all nations will be anguish and perplexity at the rolling and tossing of the sea. Yeah, this is also written before that. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of Gentiles are fulfilled, written. So Old Testament and New Testament consistent. And there will be this thing happen. Signs, sun and moon and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity, the rolling and tossing of the sea. What is written in Matthew is that the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The heavenly but then the stars will fall from the sky. According to scientists, when the rogue moon, damaged moon, comes a little bit close to the sun, what happens? It affects the axis on the planet. The planet is so perfectly aligned on its axis that even the smallest tilt causes the roaring and tossing of the sea. And you imagine Pacific, Atlantic, in India, roaring and tossing of the sea. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity. The anguish is, in Greek, Zenoki, uniquely used here, except one more time in Second Corinthians. It's translated severe anxiety, anguish. And Combined with the perplexity, so very unique word written only here, aporia. The Holy Spirit seems to inspire, look, with such word to express their heart condition. Anguish and perplexity. It's confusion in the most severe form. Anguish and perplexity. And then you think a principle of what is coming on the earth. Also, faint is apostle. You record it only here. Shock is so great, they will faint, meaning breathe out, exp expire. They will be scared to death. This is lethal emotional trauma causing rapid pulse, low blood pressure, cardiac collapse. This, can be, this fear can be the greatest fear ever since man was cast out from the Garden of Eden. And faint. This is also written in the Old Testament, Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 13, it says, All hands will go limp. Every heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. Mm. Of course, Isaiah is talking about God's judgment upon Babylon, but it's a small preview of what is coming on the, on the earth, in the world. In Isaiah chapter 24, God is going to lay waste the earth, devastate it. 
He will ruin his face and scatter his people. Inheritance. The earth will dry up and wither us. The world withers and languish. The exalted of the earth languish. Wow. It happens. The exalted of the earth languish. Because the earth is defied by his people because they disobey the law. So what is written in the Old Testament? What is written in the Old Testament? The same. Men, all kinds of men here, when you fit, all kinds of people. So when you read Revelation chapter 6, the kings, the princes, the rich, the mighty, the generous, the every slave man, every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and rocks of mountains. They caught the mountains and rocks, fallen us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, the rest of the Lamb. This, the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? All kinds of people. Wait. You can't stop their position. Just want us to. Yes, you also believe this. Coming. Then Jesus says further, let's read this verse together. Okay? Please. At that time, they'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with a power and great glory. Okay? When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. See? How powerful His coming is with a power and great glory. Let's think about his power. It is coming. He can send the entire creation into disarray and chaos. They can reorganize in a split second, create a totally new environment, changing the, changing the topology, topography of the sea and the earth, altering the sky. Ah, he can do that, reorganize, totally making new environment. And he'll destroy Satan, demons, hmm? Antichrist, and enemy armies. His power is really absolutely stunning, shocking beyond comprehension. His power. Also, a splendorous coming, glorious coming. The totally darkened earth becomes suddenly bright, seven times brighter than by the sun. The light is shone from the face of Christ. Power and glory work together. And it is glorious and powerful coming. The people of the nations, they mourn in fear and anguish and perplexity, trying to find the secure place, hiding place, no courage to look up. Why people of the world respond in that way? The people of Jesus, those belong to Christ, they stand up. Which means look up, heads up their heads, lift up their heads. What a contrast. Amen. Amen. Wow. They are mourning. No way to look up. But Jesus people, stand up. Look up. Lift up their heads. Because your redemption is drawing near. Redemption can be the most important word in the Bible. Redemption implies by paying the price. In Ephesians, Paul said, In Him we have redemption through his blood. Redemption. The word redeem or redemption is written four times in Luke's Gospel. In Song of Zechariah, he has come and has redeemed his people. When the baby Jesus came to the temple with his parents, in the parents' arm, Prophet Anna saw this and said to those who spoke about his child, those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem, this refers to the first coming. In chapter 24, two disciples who were heading a mouse out of fear when Jesus died on the cross. The reason Christ appeared in Cognito, and they said, we hoped this, he was the one who, the, going to, who is going to lead in Israel. And now, your redemption is near. This redemption is redemption of the, our bodies. On top of redemption of our souls. That's what Paul talking about. We grow inwardly for the redemption of our bodies. The day of our redemption of our bodies will be the glorious day. Day of our glorification. We shall be like Jesus. That's God's purpose for us. Within Romans chapter 8, we might be conformed to the likeness of His Son Jesus. That we might 
he might become the first one among many brothers. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians, just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. John also said, when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Do you understand this? We shall see him as he is. I know some of you have a good eyesight, 20 20 vision. But with that eyes, those eyes, you cannot see him because your eyes are blinded. Blind. But with redeemed eyes, we shall see him. We shall be like him. Amen. What a hope. Praise God for his redemption. It is coming. Complete redemption. Praise God. Wow. So, look up. Lift up your hands. Look up. So, Paul said, send your hearts on things above. Send your minds on things above, not earthly things. Look up. Also, lift up your hands. That should be our attitude in life in this world. Be confident in life. Before anyone, lift up your hands. Because the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Lift up your hands. A hope, confidence in life. Amen. Yes. And when all these things happen, these things will not pass away, this generation. When all these things happen, the kingdom of God is near. As you start in Matthew's Gospel, all the nations will be gathered before him. He will judge him. Who will enter his kingdom? Kingdom of God is near. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but more words will never pass away. There must be our preparation. Be careful. Or your heart will be laid down with the desperation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. For that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Let's read verse 36 together. Now, please, be always on the watch. And you pray, you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Wow! You may be able to escape all that is about to happen. Escape. Be able to count it worthy to escape. We are reminded of what Jesus said to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 10. Since you kept my command to endure patiently, a came from the hour of trials that has come upon the whole world to test those who live there. Escape! Paul also said in 2 Thessalonians. Hmm? While, while people say peace and safety, destruction will come suddenly. They will not escape. But you are not in darkness. So put on faith and love as plate plates. The hope of salvation as helmet. And then, be joyful always, pray continually, keep thanks in all circumstances. Wow! What a preparation. Thank God for His glorious and powerful coming. He wants us to lift our hands joyfully, being always on the watch and praying. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for your study. Jesus at close teachings three times after the of Daniel. You speak to us. You speak to us. Son of will come with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, look up, little your hands, because your redemption is drawing near. What a glorious day it will be. Truly, this is our hope in Jesus Christ, who redeemed us through his death on the cross and shedding his blood. Father, have mercy us not to lose this hope, not to lose this glory through your son Jesus. Father, help us to set our hearts on things above, set our minds on things above, live with confidence into our heads joyfully. Be always on the watch and praying. 
Surely you may be able to escape all this about to happen. Be able to stand before the Son of Man. Remember your people one by one, young and old. This uh, hope, glory, may remain in our hearts, grow stronger. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.